in love and light. This is Healthy Talk Show for Thursday, October 31st, 2019. Happy Halloween. I'm Robert. And I'm Marissa. Show notes will be over at healthytalkshow.com forward slash 29. On this episode of Healthy Talk Show, we have teachers striking, prisoners fighting fires, and why you shouldn't trust Equifax. But first... A blanket ban on political advertising from one of the world's leading social networks. Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey announced his decision, saying the reach of political messages should be earned, not bought. While internet advertising is incredibly powerful and very effective for commercial advertisers, that power brings significant risk to politics, where it can be used to influence votes to affect the lives of millions. It's a very French way of actually thinking about it. Yeah. That's why I like French. 24 reporting on it, although other news outlets did, but I... Well, Dorsey said the ban will not include ads encouraging voter turnout or the accounts of politicians who can continue to tweet freely. Twitter will release the full details of the policy next month before it takes effect globally on November 22nd. Twitter's decision to do away with paid ads is widely seen as a swipe at Facebook, whose CEO Mark Zuckerberg remains committed to allowing them, even when they contain false information. Oh my gosh. I know. I guess I cut the taint. I cut it off after that. That was pretty, funny. Yeah, that was pretty funny. <laughs> a little loaded there. So uh, They're basically cutting off their knees because political advertising is a big moneymaker for yeah. everyone. I don't know. I was just about to ask. There. I mean, that's how the mainstream media makes his money. Yeah, maybe Twitter can make their money elsewhere. I know last week or the week before they had an earnings call. I don't want to go into it too much. But basically, they lost money in ad revenue because their ad system messed up and they had to pay back. What? Yeah. How does that even happen? It's very yeah, it's very that complex is, and it's Yeah. I'm I'm really curious how they measure that ad engagement. Yep. But my other question is too is they didn't address how they talk about how their algorithms are have been shown to be biased. <laughs> Cuz you know those algorithms yeah. are programmed by people oh, with their absolutely. own political Google bias. Google is currently being accused <laughs> of influence all these yeah. all the any of one that could possibly influence elections is now being accused yeah, of it. So it's, so it's, it's just going around to everyone. Especially because, I mean, they're going to allow the politicians to tweet. That's still kind yeah. of a form of free advertisement. Look at Trump. Yeah. <laughs> he tweets all the time. Yeah. So but, I, what, what's Twitter going to do? I Yeah. Is well, Twitter... How are they going to survive, I, though? They I really, probably won't survive. Well... They're going to have to go to a free model or something because they're or yeah. an open source... Oh, no. I thought they were, would start charging users somehow. No. I don't know. That, that's hard. It's hard to get people to pay after the service has been free. Yeah. A lot of people said Facebook should have been should have been a paid service. It would have been a lot better. Yeah, I've heard that argument. More of a quality argument. service. Kind of like the dating services. The <laughs> quality ones are the paid ones, generally speaking. But then we, we didn't we talk about how there were fake profiles on there? Oh yeah, that's that's part of the quality experience. Oh, oh the quality fake, po- fake profiles on the fa- on the free uh, ones too. Fake profiles everywhere. Yeah. Moving on, CBS this morning. The Affordable Care Act requires many insurance plans to cover mammograms as a preventive benefit every one to two years for women age 40 or older. But about 40 percent of those women have dense breasts and often need a secondary test their insurance won't pay for. Johnson isn't alone with her $646 bill. A woman in... For a second mammogram. Jeez. Maryland told us she wound up paying $350 for additional tests. Another in California told us she was charged $912. Oh, my God. Why isn't most expensive in California? That's why people can't (laughs) live there. An additional test during her routine screening. Some women are charged for these tests without knowing that it's not covered by their insurer. Pat Halpin Murphy heads the Pennsylvania Breast Cancer Coalition. But women want to know whether that anomaly in their breast is breast cancer or not. So they say, okay, I'll take the additional screening test. And then they get these enormous bills and they can't pay them. That's unreasonable and I think unconscionable. And we want to change that. The coalition says in dense breasts, mammograms miss more than 50% of cancers present. That's... (laughs) Yeah, I I think we talked about that. 
And I, we should have looked at which episode. A good still, though, you know, so we could freeze frame that just in <laughs> oh, case. I try nice. to do that now. Post in Pennsylvania would require <clears throat> insurers to cover the additional screenings, including ultrasounds and MRIs, for women with dense breasts and others at increased risk for breast cancer. Oh, sucks. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's tough because we know that, you know, the price of medical coverage that's all inflated when you go to the hospital the drugs are all marked up because there's no real competition yeah so i don't know how you set the price but you also need these screenings yes people are getting ripped off for preventative i know which is terrible that is horrible but i also don't really know the solution (laughs) it's always where does the money come from someone has to pay for it new york times why children and pregnant women may want to eat more fish. Ah, yeah. Are we, are we oh at this again? God. Are we back to this again? That's, are we back to this? <laughs> this well, is why we do our show, to remind you that they keep changing their minds. Yep. Here's a doctor from Massachusetts General Hospital. She just uploaded a video, I believe, today. True or false, pregnant women avoid fish for mercury concerns or should avoid fish for mercury concerns. Fish and seafood are a phenomenal source of both protein and healthy omega-3 fatty acids. More research is showing that the benefits really can outweigh the risks when it comes to consuming fish during pregnancy. And most recent data shows that the healthy omega-3s might offer some protection from mercury damage. So the takeaway here, once again, is variety and moderation. The recommendation is to stick to about 12 ounces of total fish or seafood a week during pregnancy. And in real life terms, that's about a three to four ounce portion, something the size of a deck of cards or the palm of your hand. You can safely consume this much fish three to four times a week while continuing to avoid the highest mercury contributors such as shark or swordfish. Very small piece of fish. It always goes back to moderation though. That's right. <laughs> That's always the same conclusion. Eat this in moderation. So, Yep. And from the New York Times article, pregnant women have been advised to avoid eating fish high in mercury, such as tuna and swordfish. Three of the studies that include data on mercury content reported that the beneficial effect was present even when the elevated level, even with the level, elevated levels of mercury. Yeah. I'm kind of curious how they determined that, but... Yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> Again, it's the usual avoid the high mercury I'm sure next ones. week we'll be back to avoid fish yeah. for pregnant women. And everything in moderation. Yep. The same with everything. <laughs> yep. Exactly. WGN News. Last night, the union's House of Delegates met to vote on the mayor's latest offer and approved a tentative agreement. The contract includes a 16% pay raise over the next five years, adding a nurse and a social worker in every school, and $35 million to reduce class sizes. But they are still battling over these makeup days. Without them, teachers won't get paid for being on strike. Mayor Lightfoot says she won't do it because she doesn't want to extend the school year. This has already been enough of an inconvenience for families. She also says this issue never came up in prior negotiations and claims union leadership continues to move the goalpost. But here we are after students have missed 10 days of class and the CTU leadership has chosen to throw a curveball into the process rather than say yes to victory. The Chicago teacher strike. It's a huge strike. This is very <laughs> Abs- interesting. Humongous. You know, all the teachers that I know, they love their students. So for them to be striking for so long. Yeah. It really attests to the conditions. Yeah, well, they better be careful asking for back pay, though, because CBS Evening News. They've come all the way from the Philippines to do a job fewer and fewer Americans want to do, teach. I heard what? from my friend that there's uh, a massive hiring of teachers here in U.S. Nationwide, there are more than 3,000 international teachers in U.S. classrooms, up 50 percent from 2014. So there's. 50 percent oh my this is insane 50 percent there's more vacancies than applicants the pay isn't very attractive where we finally well, decide okay uh you don't see an issue with that yeah that they can't pay people no let's not pay quality people to spend time with our children educate yeah. our children Just forget that no <laughs> let's not do that that it would probably be time to look overseas. Does it seem what? like the job of a teacher is being outsourced? Yes, definitely. In fact, I'm seeing a lot of that. I just love this one. The majority of those teachers come from the Philippines. Welcome to Dusan, huh? 
and we were there when another teacher arrived. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is unbelievable, to be honest. It's uh, incredible because it's exploitation of the Philippines. Yes. And so now you've sold them this American dream. <laughs> Come over to America. We have jobs for you. Oh, wait. That's because we can't pay our teachers a decent wage. I mean, it's been all over the news that teachers work multiple jobs and can't afford yep. to live. That it's ridiculous. <laughs> it is absolutely ridiculous. So you, these people, teachers are essentially your child care during the day. They're the ones yeah. taking care of your kids. And, you want the best. You want the best. And they're so they're supposed to teach your children, discipline your children, now be a mentor, yeah, be a mental, mental health, health expert. <laughs> you are asking things. way too much of your teachers, yeah. and then you don't pay them anything. anything. And I know the educators are overworked. But yes. They do it for the love of the students, but they have to make a living. Yeah, it is, absolutely. This is insane. Everybody has to make a living, and you, these people take, they're teaching your kids. It's, this is fundamental stuff. This is, yeah. <sighs> and I don't and then it's just crazy. We're gonna have more people here. Yep. And then what's gonna happen to those teachers who weren't getting paid well? I I'm unemployment. <laughs> uh, where's where's everyone going? Don't know. Uh moving on from exploitation to more exploitation of prisoners now. We want to turn to the more than 4,000 firefighters working across California to contain the blazes. At least 700 of them are California prisoners. While salaried firefighters earn an annual mean wage of like $74,000 a year, uh, plus benefits, prisoners earn about a dollar an hour when fighting— Dollar an hour. —eating active fires. <laughs> And one dollar an hour. How is that not exploitation? But, you know, it's it's no, it's not exploitation because, of course, when they're done and they serve their sentence, rehabilitation, oh. so they can be firefighters after the fact, right? Point. What of, is astounding of, you know, is the level of experience and danger they face and the experience they get when they get out of right. prison are not allowed to be firefighters, so end up often serving the rich, being private firefighters around estates. What? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, and I cut out the other half of this video where they were talking about how they didn't give evacuation orders to the cleaning crews to all these rich people. <laughs> so they, 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 they wasn't properly communicated. So apparently these, like the maids and stuff were showing up to these evacuated areas because they weren't properly communicated to that hey, there's a freaking fire going on and they're showing up for work. I, I cut out that part because oh it's just gosh. been way too long. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, there's so many things crazy with that statement. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. I think that they're... Um, it really doesn't make sense that, you know, we come home and that there is this large barrier. We're not able to get EMT licenses, which is what we need to be working at municipal fire departments, um, because there are really clear restrictions on, um, you know, being licensed when you have two or more felonies on your record or you, um, you know, have a charge that's seven years um, or, or less. And so uh, basically, we, we have folks that are really trained up and uh, have the potential to come home and be a really productive member of society and have uh, stable careers. And um, that is not happening. We have folks that are coming home and unable to keep um, minimum wage jobs because of the barriers that exist. And she yeah. knows something about that. She's a former prison firefighter, Amika Moda, who's now an activist for cause yeah this is something that's been an ongoing issue yeah it's, it keeps popping up every time california I, erupts in fires yeah cause we start we, talking about prison firefight we forget about them and, oh by the way yeah because without them i don't know how we would pay for yeah and no one talks about that either and then there's no benefit for them yeah. so again just horrible exploitation yep so once again the prison system yep. hurting the poor Switching gears from exploitation, finally, to privacy. CBS This Morning. Prosecutors say Uber launched its own version of a manhunt to track down the two 20-something hackers that extorted the company out of $100,000 oh. in exchange for a promise to delete 57 million user files they stole off a third-party server. 
The Justice Department says within weeks of paying the ransom, Uber employees showed up at Brandon Glover's Winter Park, Florida home and found Vasily Maraker at a hotel restaurant in Toronto, Canada. The pair... This is a crazy story. So Uber yeah. has not contacted any law enforcement or anything. They're doing this all, themse- all themselves okay. right now. I'm glad you clarified that. <laughs> this is what's going on. <laughs> that was weird. Okay. They admitted their crimes, but Uber didn't turn them over to the cops. Instead, what? they had the hackers sign non-disclosure agreements uh, uh, uh. promising to keep quiet. <laughs> so, oh my God. They had hackers sign NDAs, which... What? They hacked you. Dude. Why do you think they're going to respect an NDA? What? The? Oh, okay. So t- please tell me what happens next. Do you feel that Uber acted responsibly? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> no oh, shit. Oh, oh my God. Oh, sorry. Part of my French. <laughs> I shouldn't have. <laughs> Dave Anderson is the U.S. attorney for the Northern District of California. Have you seen a company ask for an NDA from people who've ripped them off before? I can't think of another case that our office has handled that has that dimension to it. <laughs> That's a really nice way of putting it. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> That's stupid. <laughs> this case is extraordinary in that regard. It's extraordinary. It's an extraordinary case. Do you know what was done with that data after they paid? Not definitively. And there's no way to know definitively. We know that the defendants said that they destroyed that data, but there was a third participant in the hack. And uh, that Wait, third his NDA? was unknown to Uber. The hackers also targeted a company owned by LinkedIn in December of 2016, but prosecutors say LinkedIn did not pay and promptly reported the hack to police. Uber eventually... Did- Good. Good job. Good job. Called what? the police. So... so- my other question is then, what is Uber really hiding? Isn't that kind of weird? Well, the thing about Uber that a lot of people don't realize is their their business is their data. That's their business. Yeah. Their rider data is their business. That's and that's what they hacked. <laughs> so that's it's very curious. Yeah, they hacked their business. <laughs> Did as well. A year after the hack, new CEO Dara Khazrashi publicly disclosed the attack. The two hackers were eventually arrested and pleaded guilty on Wednesday to conspiracy to commit extortion. Uber behaved atrociously. Wired editor in chief Nick Thompson says with cyber crimes on the rise, our personal data remains vulnerable. We've come up with all kinds of smart ways to protect data, and hackers have come up with all kinds of smart ways to get through our protections. Your data is held in a bunch of places. And each one of those places needs to be secure. No. Well, he's... No. <laughs> There's a conclusion to this story, if you'd like to hear it. I left it in because it's funny. All right. First time those two hackers met in person was after they were arrested. They now face a maximum of five years in prison. That third person involved remains at large. Ah! Nice. <laughs> Uber said it cannot comment on an ongoing criminal investigation. Last year, the company settled with the FTC and paid $148 million to settle a nationwide investigation brought by state attorneys general over this hack. Gail? That's oh a big number. Gosh. Thank you very much, Chris. That is a big number. $148 million? Yeah. Okay. So now moving on to our main topic, unless you've got... No, I'm ready for All it. All right, Equifax. We kind of remember them. I have a story to tell. It's about privacy. This is Uber. Just got hacked. People are getting hacked all the time. Yeah. Equifax. Let's learn about the credit invisibles. Just to open us up here. This is how interested they are. They have a term for people who don't have credit. And please mind the editing. I edited out all of his pauses. So if you're watching the video, it's going to be very jarring. But if you're listening to the audio, it'll sound really good. And it's not going to be 3,000 second video or however many seconds, 3,000 minutes I mean. If the financial institutions knew that I had two years of stable income, two years of rental payments, two years of utility payments, two years of phone payments, they did not. They relied on one dimension of data, the credit data. I didn't have a credit file. I didn't have a credit score. Whether you're an immigrant or not, no one is born with a credit. Have you ever seen a father looking at an ultrasound and say, oh my God, it's a beautiful girl, and she has a credit score of 800? (laughs) No, no. There are 25 million people in this country who are credit invisible. 50% of the population in LATAM is credit invisible. 10% 
adult population in the UK, in Canada, Spain, are credit, credit invisible. We should help, we can help, and we must help this group. Wait, help them. Wait, why do they need help? They need, they need help. Credit. What the hell is credit? Yeah, what the? Okay, you have the three agencies we all know about, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. I have no idea what the hell credit is either. I have no yeah, idea. No, it, nobody it's, knows. It's they, supposed to be how well you borrow and return money or some but credit. To, what infor- Equifax. Equifax <laughs> runs other services. Uh, credit. Credit's a lot of information. Equifax. There's something called the work number. What is the work number? Let's I, learn. It's another morning in HR. The phone rings. The emails chime. It's early, but the verifiers are already lining up. Landlords, background screeners, government agencies. They need employment. In- Landlords, background mm. screeners, and government agencies. Information, oh. and they need it quick. Every request means more paperwork. Every request means an employee is relying on you. How do you handle this workload? Better yet, how do you not have to handle it? How do you break free from it all? Yeah, you break free by following the lead of 82% of Fortune 500 co- 82% companies Dang. and thousands of other employers across the country. You break free by using the Work Number database. A secure, simple way to automate your employee verifications. The Work Number database is the largest of its kind, giving more than 375,000 credentialed verifiers real time access to the employee information they need. Employee wait. information you need? What? Wait, what information wait. do you have? You just wait. have my credit number, right? I know. It's like so now 750 or something, I'm, isn't it? I'm getting really disturbed. What's my, what's my I... credit number? That's okay. Yeah, people could look up my credit number. That's cool. That's all you have, just my credit number. While helping you remove the workload and potential liability oh, no. from your department and offering better security and privacy for your employees. Because while access is quick, it is also very controlled. As with Uber and all these other, <laughs> all these issues that everyone, all this privacy, all these data mishaps that keep popping yeah, up. They, yep. This is secure though. Equifax, trust Equifax. Trust the work number. Trust Equifax, please. Trust Equifax. Every verifier must be vetted and approved before they receive information from the database. Wait, but how are they approved? Because they're talking about landlords. Think of how many landlords there are. And I'm pretty sure I've had many landlords run this. Yeah. The small ones. Purpose and employee consent for every request. And every request is tracked so employees can see exactly who accessed their information and when. Safe, we can? secure, no, and fast. The work not- you can. Uh, you have to sign up for an account. And blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you can act. You theoretically should be able to access this information. Interesting. Number database keeps life moving for your employees. Theoretically. And it helps you break free. The work number database from Equifax Workforce Solutions. Okay. So we didn't learn too much from this cool video. Yeah. So and I actually thought of a funny story because they mentioned agencies. I used to work for a government agency and we used the work number. Uh-huh. Uh, the agency I worked for, part of their, their program needed this service. They need to be able to run credit. It's like welfare program. They need to be able to run yeah. credit. So what the work number did is they raised their price from a few hundred dollars a year for government agencies to several thousand dollars a year. Oh my God. And we tried as procurement, we tried to go out and find a competitor. You can't because they're, they're the only ones. That is. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. No wonder 82% of the people mm-hmm, have Because, to. yeah, 82% of the people have to use it. Dang. Or ha- Fortune 500 companies have to use it. So, okay. All right. So there's that. What data is let's all look, in there? Well, let's see. I had a sample report. Here we go. Oh. There's a sample report that doesn't actually show me anything. This, where's this from? This is from Equifax itself. Uh, employment data report. So here's a sample report that, you know, you can see. And I have a video that shows this medical insurance, dental insurance, all this what? weird stuff. Yeah, you can see a lot of why, different, you can why? see if people have insurance, you can see their income. Here's another sample I found from Kansas, I think. I can't see the full screen. I'm a little blind here. Yeah, University of Kansas. And it's like a simple sample one, but I found a video. So let's roll into the video. I, it's, just let me know when it runs long. It's a bad video. And what we'll be showing next is the results page. So on his screen, it's just a simple interface, social security number, and you got a bunch of other stuff like permissible purpose, permissible purpose, and, and other stuff, other terms for your search query. <clears throat> the top of the page will consist of basically a header that, that echoes back to you as the caseworker. Here's my order details. Here's the requester, which was myself, Peter. 
Here's the date of which this record was requested. As you can see, it's the 9th today of October, as well as what social security number did I use? Do I have a tracking number on it? So that, that's a header that is on all reports for organizational purposes. And this is where you'll actually see the work number results returned. In this case, this test has three records that are, that are returned or, or three transactions. Three transactions. I love it. Three transactions. All right. Specific to that six month lookup. You'll see that in the twin header here, record one of three. You'll get the employer information, employee details, such as their reported address, anything that comes from payroll. Jeez. Yeah, because your employer is reporting this information on you, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know how to stop that. Yeah. How long is the tenure? What medical benefits are offered? And does this person use those benefits? Wow. What? Yeah. Whether we use you, those benefits? Yeah. Why, why do they need to know anything of mm -hmm. that? Is there workers' compensation? And of course, I'm trying to calculate modified adjusted gross income. So here we are with the gross and, and net earnings. Wow. As yep. I scroll down, I'm, I'm doing, I'm going to go a little bit faster for brevity. Wait, isn't that all your pay stubs right there? Is that what that is? Yes, they can see. Yes. That is terrible. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. None of your information is private. All this digital stuff, every, it's great. This it's great for spying on people. Yeah. This is a historic look back of five years. You'll actually see the second run. It's probably like a monthly. It'll probably be like a monthly rundown or something. I don't know what that's tracking. I can't see the numbers clearly, but. So record two of three. But you look at people's financials for this. This is that's in, one that's of the biggest points. You're looking up so much credit and seeing how much money they make because they're making income claims. You got to be able to make sure that they're actually making that amount of money. I'll go even faster. One hell of a report in this sample report. Very record long. Record three of yeah. three. Three records. Shown. So that is your results screen and, and how you'll actually see your twin. But there's another way records. to get more money Now what out if of you. I want to buy additional, additional uh, records? Buy additional more? records step of today. What else could so there be? In this case, maybe this, this individual said, you know what, Mr. Caseworker, I actually did work at Goodyear Rubber and Tire Company, but I don't see it listed under the six-month lookup. So let me click on additional records. All this says to me is spend more money. This is dumb. This yeah. doesn't even make sense. That's why I left it. <laughs> this just, just, why didn't this originally come up? The caveat here is when you click this additional records and actually select them, you are indeed buying or increasing the amount of transactions on this search. Wow. So instead of clicking new order, this is the, the proper way to do it if you're looking at the same individual. So like I said, I wanted to search Goodyear Tire and Rubber. I'll click view additional records. And what you'll see is a notification on the top right hand corner that says additional records have been added to your order. And of course, the one of three now what? becomes one of four since that additional record was purchased. Well, that was a scam. Yeah, yeah it was purchased. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, wow. Can you just give it to me with the initial order? I know. Why do you get the first three for free? But it's cool. You know, we, we trust and we can trust Equifax. Am I right, yeah. everybody? Let's trust them with our data. Let's trust them. We don't remember last year. <laughs> the uh, whole lawsuit, the oh. whole privacy thing. Well, let's look into this more. Forbes reporting. According to a filing in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Georgia, Equifax was protecting sensitive personal information on a portal used to manage credit disputes with the username and password of admin. Admin. Oh. That's the default username and password for everything that's connected to the internet. Routers, but, but everything. I thought it was secure. Yeah, I thought they were secure and safe. I thought, I thought it Equifax was safe, yeah. no, Equ oh. As your data happily traveled mm -hmm. from person to person. Equif the same company. The lawsuit points out that Equifax was storing unencrypted user data on a public-facing server, so it could have been viewed by any oh attacker. Equifax didn't encrypt its mobile applications either, and when it did encrypt data, it left the encryption keys on the same public-facing servers. No way. It's basically leaving the keys to the car on the roof of the car. Why yeah. have the encryption? Why lock the doors if yeah. you leave the key? That's stupid. The Equifax breach in 2017 exposed the sensitive information of 147 million people across the world, including social security numbers and personal addresses. In July of this year, Equifax was fined $700 million for the hack, with $425 million going to a fund to compensate the affected customers. The Equifax cash payment is capped at $20,000, but it's looking unlikely that many people will even get the lower 
$125 since the FTC later confirmed that Equifax couldn't afford the promised payout. What? Instead, effective customers have been ordered, offered free credit monitoring. And why would you trust Equifax for that? Why? Right. <laughs> they use admin yeah. for their username and passwords. What? Plus, <laughs> is atrocious. Any IT professional, ask your IT professional. They will laugh at you. Tell them about, they'll laugh. Your IT professional will just laugh at you. Yeah, admin, that, admin. That's, that's insane. Plus, you can look up your own credit history. You don't need to buy yeah. into anything. So that's just false. So okay. Equifax is bad. But now Credit Karma. Everyone loves Credit Karma. They're cool. Oh, they're, cra- no. they're great. Credit Karma's good. Everyone loves Credit Karma. They're hip. <laughs> Everyone has the app. They're great. Every- we love Credit Karma. Is Credit Karma cool? Uh, October 30th, 2018, the CEO of Credit Karma was on Bloomberg. CEO Ken Lin talking about their growth. Ken, so after the Equifax breach happened, signups at Credit Karma actually spiked, which means that consumers were going to trust yet another financial institution oh, no. for sensitive data to protect. Yeah, that's, she's even framing it. It's perfect. Yeah. Protect themselves. So what's your reaction to that? Um, well, you know, I, I think that it's important to note that, you know, this is something that more and more will happen. And, you know, it's important what? to uh, make sure that you have the right access and the right protection. Yeah, he, he did say that more breaches will happen. Oh, well, I didn't know what he was saying, that more people will trust you with your data or that you'll just get hacked again. <laughs> I think he was saying that more you'd get hacked again. <laughs> I think for, for us, it was signing, there's a first party relationship. that really- Or more people will move over. Maybe he's really that confident. It really matters. I think the outrage at times was, you know, you know a company that you didn't have a relationship got breached and your information was lost and stolen. I think for credit card, we very much focus on having that access and education, making sure that consumers understand what that is. So that was from last year. Actually, almost, yeah. Yeah, not bad. Wait, that was from, oh, that was from this year. That was from last year, the 30th. Yeah, so oh. October 30th, that's right. October 30th, all right. So this f- credit karma. But he's going to build a relationship. Yes. What does that mean? So to moving your app? forward to this year, there was this conference called the Future of FinTech Conference in New York City. It was in June 2019. So here's Ken Lin again, familiar face, telling us what Credit Karma is. Credit Karma was founded a little bit more than 12 years ago with the idea that credit scores are really the, one of the defining metrics of a consumer's financial health and financial health. As we've grown I, what does the that mean? business, we realize a few things. I think first is uh, when a consumer is looking for their credit score, they're actually not looking for a three-digit number. They're actually asking for what products do they qualify for. What? And I think that was the insight. Wait. To our business. Yeah. What products do I qualify yeah. when for? When you want to know your credit score, you want to know what products do I qualify for. <laughs> well, it's... That is when so... Do you, but when do you need to know your credit score when you're going to go buy something? <laughs> well, That's the only time people ever take interest in their credit score. Yeah, it's it's true, but at the same time, is that all we can think about is what our next purchase is going to be? That's what, yes. And what I can get more debt on? Absolutely. How much debt That's, can I yes. get? Yes. Yeah, well, let's talk about the debt. They've. This is a great interview. Okay. You will learn so much. <laughs> Business. So when a consumer comes to our, our, our site, we're able to give them score, uh, but more importantly, we're able to analyze all of their liabilities. So today, we probably see somewhere between you know, five or six trillion dollars worth of consumer debt. We can five wow. to six trillion dollars of consumer debt. That's how much they see just from their users. Uh, trillions. That's the debt. That's yeah. That's the problem. Everybody has debt. Yeah. Determine: Are you paying too much for that debt? Is that reasonably priced based on your credit profile? And we're able to suggest to somebody who's paying nineteen percent for an auto loan that. That 19% should really be 12%. You're going to save $175 a month. Um, and, you know, it's for the same term. And really, the, and, that, and if the consumer does that, our member does that, then they will save that money. Our banking partners get a new customer. We get a bounty from that, which is our revenue model. And the cycle continues. And as we have continued to build a product, we also realize that, you know, consumers are just crying out for help in terms of how do we manage, how do, how do we help them manage their finances? Because as everyone in this room knows, technology has made most consumer products more complicated, not less. Because people are stupid and don't have to 
do yeah. things. I don't know what he's saying. That's what right he's now. saying. Oh, it's, it's throughout this whole interview. And there have been fewer and fewer tools to help digest and understand that, that, that notion. Right. Yeah. So the, the business model is lead gen, basically, and is it, it also a freemium? I mean, can you pay to be a member? or what is that the one source of revenue, or how does that work? Yeah, it's the only source of revenue, okay. and, and it's actually one of our core principles at Credit Karma is how to make everything free. How to make everything free. Yeah, well, you know, nothing is free. Yeah. So what's the price? Well, let's learn about active users and engagement. How do you keep people active? I mean, isn't it, you know, you could see this sort of being a one and done kind of thing. Um, so how do you sort of, you know, get traction with customers? Yeah, and I think this is one of the things that people miss is that it goes back to this notion of consumers are really looking for help with their finances. And, you know, you think about a credit score, and I think that's actually, by the way, the wrong interpretation of what Credit Karma is as a business, uh, but I'll come back to that later. Um, what people are trying to do is they're trying to understand their money. And what Credit Karma is able to do is give them a quick snapshot of all their accounts in a single place. We're able to give them helpful tips. I mean, wait, I don't. Yeah, a single snapshot. I, what do you need a snapshot? You need a snap because you're stupid. You don't and, want to read the financial data. And, you don't want a balance check book. reported in your credit card. It's your credit card. So what? You can't balance your credit cards by yourself. I don't understand. I, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> Do things like you know tell you like hey there's uh, five thousand dollars sitting at the state treasury because uh, some life insurance policy yeah, cashed right. out and they weren't able to find you right so so I it it that does happen. I've never heard. I've never heard of it happening with Credit Karma, but there are yeah. actually states that'll hold money for no, you. No, that that's true. But uh, you can look that up through your yeah, state. Yeah, you can look you that up by need, yourself. You don't yeah. need Credit Karma, exactly. <laughs> I think it's those delightful things that keep people engaged. But it's also that single, simple place of understanding your finances, which is driving the engagement. Um, and I think something that consumers are really looking for. Are they something looking that's for what, that? Well, it's they're going to be looking for because he's selling it. That's well, what he has to sell. That's the trap, though. I want to learn about KPIs and OKRs and metrics and other business speak. How do you measure success? What are some of your KPIs, your OKRs, um, metrics that you use to... KPI, Key Performance Indicator, OKR, Objectives, and Key Results. Oh, thanks. I didn't measure the business. Got you. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think one is, you know, one is the overall number of members that we have. We think that's an important metric. Um, you know, we, we think and we know that more and more consumers are confused, uh, confused about their finances, right? I think oh my you know, some God. of our data says, like... He's just on and on berating people. Yeah, people are confused about their finances. Look, he's even... Look, that's his impression of a consumer. I, I don't think that people know. are confused. I, I think I don't get, I don't get it. I don't get, the, I don't get it. It's too <laughs> I, confusing. I think they know that they're underpaid and they have too many bills. I think people are pissed off. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, a little bit more than half have uh, you know, great angst around their dollars, can't sleep at night because of their finances. And we think that that... Yeah, yeah because they <laughs> cause the teachers don't make anything. Yeah, that's why they're striking. <laughs> there is a really big opportunity. So, so point being... Big opportunity. Look at him. He's getting all wet. <laughs> big opportunity. Yeah, because he's about to make some money. Yep. That we want to provide all of the services necessary to make that angst go away. So when we talk about credit monitoring, when we talk about tax preparation, when we talk about what's the best loan and the transparency around it and how to get out of debt, we look at it um, as what services are we building to drive the most amount of users to register on our platform. So that's one KPI, which is just the sheer number. Okay, it's one KPI, the sheer number. One KPI. Would you like to know the second KPI? Yeah. Two is engagement. We think it's really important to keep people engaged around their finances. I think I the love worst the outcome term engagement. engagement. It's keep, always about engagement. Keep people engaged around measure, their finances. How do you measure engagement? Yeah, and around your finances. How the hell is that? Is just more you spend or? <laughs> yeah. It must be. Am I engaged? I don't spend money. Finances. No. I think the worst outcome for people is when they stick their heads in the sand and not really focus on what matters. It's one of those things where if you're trying to optimize something, but you don't pay attention to it, you don't have the metrics, you don't have the KPIs on your own financial life, you're not going to do a very... You need the KPIs in your own financial now life. he's just spewing key yeah. terms around. Uh, buzzwords, yeah. Buzzwords. Yep. You need the key performance indicators for your personal life. <laughs> Good job of getting to the place that you want to be. So we want to be able to provide those services. Engagement tends to be the driver. Engagement. He, engagement. He still didn't say how he was going to ac have actual engagement. <laughs> he did not. Last metric. Uh, then lastly, we think about what we call share of wallet internally, which is, 
you know, we know that consumers on average will take out 1.1 1 .1, uh, loans per year. 1.1 loans. On average, a consumer to take out 1.1 loans okay. per year. What does that mean? Is that opening new credit cards? Is that buying a car? I, it would have to be just, either. Yeah. But 1.1, so people are taking out a loan a year? <laughs> that's horrifying. Is that true? Ask at com. Yeah, that's why I was wondering what, what do they define as a loan, but... Yeah. <laughs> and we think about, well, okay, if that's the case, what percentage of those are we driving? Are we helping them find the, the right ones? Uh, and then lastly, it's got to be, that's their business. It's, it's the <laughs> bounty we, on the loans. It's the bounty we, connecting them to the, it's yeah. their whole business. Which is more of a, a you know, a, a qualitative or a measure, which is what type of progress are they making, right? Are our members hitting their goals? Are they getting out of debt? Are they saving for retirement? We think that's an important piece because I think uh, mm. most of the companies. Yeah, how do you track that? And how, yeah. how is people getting out of debt and being debt free good for your business? Explain that to me. Yeah. Uh, something doesn't make yeah. sense there. Most of the banks actually forget that piece, the human piece and the human element yeah, okay. of what we do day in and day out. It seems with like your you KPIs. The yeah, with your KPIs element. and OKRs. And yeah, instead of talking in such abstracts, why yeah. don't you try to... Let's, you know, let's hear about maybe there's more human element in key areas of business. Let, let's see here. I always say this. So, so with a lot of users, um, I, I feel like there's a lot of opportunities, right? And We've tried to confine it to three key areas on our business. Um, first is on the lending side. So we think a lot about uh, the liability side of a consumer's balance sheet. So that is the credit cards, personal loans, auto loans. They really want to look at your lending side. Yeah. They really care about you. Uh, mortgages and student loans. So we think that has to be a core pillar of what we do. Yeah, Secondarily, people have a lot of student loans. Yeah, so. That's one that's, a, that's what yeah. was that, number two? That's <laughs> high up there on the list there. Student loans, yep. Uh, we think about the savings side. So that's the planning for retirement. That's the checking. That's the uh, savings accounts. And then lastly, insurance, which is, tends to be the hedge or, or the protection of those particular assets. And you know, I always tell the company, just because we have a lot of users, we shouldn't be selling refrigerators and so on. Right? And right. the point being that there's an area that it makes sense for us to operate. There's an area for which our brand stands for something and, and um, that resonates with our members. Uh, so we need to stay in those areas. And they just I'd, announced they're opening savings accounts. I actually have no idea what he meant by his brand resonates. What <laughs> What about your brand? Just buy more stuff, get more loans. That's all I think of with yeah. Credit Karma. Put yourself into debt. Are you curious about revenues or anything? Yeah, let's let's Our hear. revenues, uh, we don't share, and that's one of the benefits of being a private company. But I think, you know, it's oh. some hundreds of millions of dollars, which has been publicized uh, before. Oh, yeah, I think I saw a number like... Yeah, 370 or something like that? Uh, that was, yeah, that was okay. a few years ago. Many years ago. Many years ago. Okay. Many years. So more than three. Okay. Uh, and then last, it's more now. That, it's more now. And then profitability. Wow. We have been profitable since 2015. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those key metrics. And you know, I think that. Yeah, they've been profitable. I, I would like to see some graphs of debt versus their profits. <laughs> Just curious. Yeah, right. They're a private company. They don't have to do oh, that. Oh, I, I know. But we trust, we credit karma, we can trust <laughs> them. They're an independent company. He's cool. It's all good. We could trust Credit Karma. You know, it's not, they're just a small independent company that's just trying to help us out, right? There's a small independent company. Oh, no shortage of capital. And Google is an investor. So that's another potential exit. I mean, would Google buy you guys? <laughs> oh, Google's an investor. Oops. Oh. Whoopsie. Uh, I can't speak for Google. You know, I actually, I mean, I, I, think, I think the reality with Google is that they have so many um, regulatory and privacy concerns that I think it's hard for them even to move into financial services in hmm. general. <laughs> I mean, I think if you take... Except for Android Pay. It's a financial service. It's no. a payment mechanism. Take a look at all of their general acquisitions and areas. I think finance has been the one that I think they're probably most shy away from because it just brings on another onslaught of regulatory frameworks and compliance frameworks that my sense is a company like them probably don't want. Particularly now, perhaps. It's good to be but, separate uh, from that stuff, you know? But, uh, you know, they're just fund generously them. giving yeah, fund you money? Yeah, them sli silently. How, how is that? Press what are they release. getting in This return? was back in 2014. Google Capital leads $85 million investment in Credit Karma. I don't know what they're doing now. It's... But Credit Karma is not shy. They, but Google is an investor. And Interesting. The interview even mentioned, "Oh, Google didn't buy yeah. you." Yeah. It's, 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 do we? What? It's, 
What is there to say about this? Uh, it's disturbing how much Google knows about you. They well, read uh, all what? your emails. Google, well, do we they, talk about Equifax? Yeah. Credit Karma, Google, all these. They all know yeah. everything. Facebook. No, I, I know I being conspiratorial because Google <laughs> doesn't really want to know everything about you. Am I right? <laughs> CNBC. Alphabet. The owner of Google has made an offer to acquire Fitbit as it, uh, quote, eyes a slice of the crowded market for fitness trackers and smart watchers. They're citing people familiar with the matter. Uh, 18% gain there. So that's the rumor going around right now that Google wants to buy Fitbit. Jeez. Yes. 18.5 uh, in what is obviously a heavily shorted name that uh, has had a journey that's taken it all around the map. Yeah, I, I don't know how hard Alphabet is bargaining here, but given where Fitbit has been trading for quite a while, as long as they're not really trying to put the screws to the company, I have to imagine they got to listen to that because getting taken out uh, by, by Google and Alphabet is usually a, uh, an outlook that a lot of companies are looking for. A lot right. of companies are looking for. Oh my! A lot gosh. of companies want to be bought out. Why does everyone want to be bought out? <laughs> That's what they all want. Why does everyone so want to? So Google wants to track people physically outside of the Android devices they already yeah. are tracking you with. Now they want to track you more precisely with the Fitbit as well. Yeah, and let's just mm. cross-reference that with all your credit karma data. Yeah, because oh no no they. They're just giving Credit Karma money for nothing. They get nothing in return for that. That's yeah. That's good business. They're just nice people. Yeah, they're nice people. They just, <laughs> they just want to help you get out of debt. Yeah, that's all they... <laughs> they want everybody to be debt-free and we'll all be and happy. retire. Yep, exactly. Yeah, with a lot of money. <laughs> Don't yeah. trust them. Your privacy is valuable. Yeah. Plus, how is he making so much money? Yeah. He was yeah. rolling in dough over there. Yeah. Meanwhile, we're exploiting... Yep. People left and right. And I bet he leads a very private life. Yeah, of course. All of his finances are locked down. Probably can't look him up on the work number. Of course not. Uh, you ready to hit the road? Yes. We record Healthy Talk Show live on Mondays and Thursdays at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 3 a.m. UTC. Head on over to healthytalkshow.com forward slash live. Please help us financially produce the show by heading over to healthytalkshow.com slash support. Your financial contribution will ensure we remain unbiased, commercial-free, and will help us pay for things like rent. Our show is value for value. If you found value in this show, please provide value back at HealthyTalkShow.com slash support. Another way to provide value is feedback. We love feedback. Our email is ask at HealthyTalkShow.com. Call us 509-878-3229 and HealthyTalkShow.com forward slash social for all of our social media links. Love and light. Love and light.